It's Lisa from Been There, Got Out. And like I said, it's been a while since I've done a live interview over Instagram, or at least it feels like it, because we were away last week. But today's guest is someone I have been looking forward to interviewing for quite a while. Let me see if I could find her. Mickey, where are you? Uh, hopefully it'll work. Anyway, we met uh, several months ago. Like I was saying, um, I don't know where Mickey is. <laughs> Keep getting her on here. I hope she, she pops on any second, but she'll introduce herself formally, but she's a collaborative divorce professional and social worker who specializes in mental health. She's also a divorce coach and an author, and she has decades worth of experience I'm here. It's saying she's unable to join, but maybe maybe she'll get on and maybe I won't be able to see her. Mickey, it says you just, just turned on video, so I can't see you, but I think we should still keep going. Okay, that's weird because we, you saw me before, but. I saw you on the video call. Can you I see me? I do, I see you. All right. I can't see you, so I'm just going to do it blindly. Okay. All right. Anyway, Mickey, but I was saying that we met um, a few months ago when Chris and I were doing our presentation to your pod of collaborative divorce professionals, and we were saying how you guys are probably best equipped to deal with uh, really difficult personalities. And some of the people in the group disagreed, but you and I had a couple of really fascinating conversations, which resulted in part to today's interview. So before we even get into that, can you now officially introduce yourself, um, give a tiny bit about your background, and I love to also ask what makes you so good at your job? Well, thank you for that vote of confidence. Um, I've been doing this a long, long time now, uh, about 20 years, and um, I work in collaborative divorce a lot. That's a big part of my work, which, um, uses a team of professionals to help a, a clients get through a divorce. And so that includes each person has their own attorney, a mental health professional, uh, which attracted Lisa that, you know, there's mental health help there to know, um, will recognize patterns of people in, in the abusive situation and uh, a financial specialist. So the beauty of that model is that the couple is supported on the legal front, the financial front, and the emotional uh, front. And so it's uh, there's a, a better chance of resolution if people are interested in um, voluntary uh, participation, that it is a voluntary process. So that, that's, there's the rub, the voluntary participation. Right. Um, yeah. So I was going to say, like I alluded to earlier, why is it so hard to get someone who is involved in a high conflict situation to collaborative divorce, which I would think would be the best way to prevent them from getting into the crazy family court system where they will just start burning through money and time and energy and being on someone else's calendar? Why doesn't everybody want to do um, collaborative divorce? Well, that, that's a question that we ask ourselves who work in collaborative divorce because we know that that is the best way to go, um, generally speaking. I mean, if you have a low conflict situation, mediation is also excellent. Um, but in the high conflict, um, well, let me just say, say that collaborative divorce differs from uh, litigation in that it's looked at as uh, divorce is a puzzle that has to be figured out. And we there are a lot of moving parts to it in any marriage, in, at, at the end of any marriage. And so in, in a collaboration, people work together, um, as strange as that may sound in, in divorce, and it's not always easy, but um, the idea is that everyone has to be okay. Uh, with the divorce. So there are professionals helping the, the clients find solutions to problems. In a court situation, as 
certainly you know, Lisa, and uh, many other listeners probably know this as well. It's a contentious situation. It's me against you. You're wrong. I'm right. And it's trying to prove that point, which is very expensive and uh, um, fruitless argument. The goal of any divorce is to get it done and get out, as the title of your excellent book um, talks about. And I do recommend Lisa's book, Been There, Got Out. Uh, it's really very well done. And in my many years now of experience, it, it's right on. It's on the money. Thank you. So, yeah. so you said well. everybody has to be okay. And that's, that's one of the problems with getting people into collaborative, right? Yes. But People who are controlling see it as an opportunity sometimes to control the situation, which they won't, but they may think that they will. So that can be an enticement to go into collaboration. With an abusive situation, a super controlling situation, this requires um, special rules, special skills on the part of the attorneys, and particularly on the part of the um, wife, say. Now, what the way I'm going to address this, just because it's easier uh, to, to understand, I think, if we take it, it can go either way. Let, a woman can be the abuser and the uncooperative one. I'm working on a case right now where um, that is the case. But we're going to talk about the man as the abuser and the wife as uh, the, the husband is the abuser, the wife is the victim in, in this uh, scenario that we're talking about. So uh, it, people need to be taken care of. A collaborative team hopefully will make everyone be okay. My philosophy, uh, Lisa and I have talked about this, is that the, the main idea is for people to get out of the marriage and to get out of the marriage in the quickest, least expensive way to go, if possible. And there needs to be incentives set up for this, which is not in a normal divorce situation. Um, and uh, it, it's always true that uh, the, the notion of divorce management is, um, it's, that's always true in any divorce, that you need to manage your own divorce. Because if you let the lawyers take charge, um, especially in a litigation, uh, a, a lot of fur is going to fly, so to speak. There, there'll be a lot of waste and a lot of you know, waste of time and money and so on. But in in the case where there is coercive control, um, divorce management means that the, per the victim who wants to get out, the person who is initiating the divorce, they want to get out. They, that has to be kept in the front of the wife's mind that in order to to get out, I'm going to have to handle myself in a certain way. And the reason you do that, even though it might be distasteful at times, is to get out. So it's a question of do you want revenge or do you want to get out? Do you want to prove you're a victim and he was such a bad person or do you want to get out? So it's a constant evaluation of uh, a person's attitude as to what's the most important. That's, that's such a good point. I mean, we, we use props with our clients and one of the most popular ones or the one that we use the most is the barf bag because it's like we say you have to play the role to get to the goal and if the goal is to get out, sometimes you have to just do things or say things not to harm yourself, but to get to the finish line. And um, you have to use extraordinary social and emotional skills. You sometimes have to use tremendous empathy. 
whether you think the person deserves it or not. And we also like to, to use a slide of um, an Oscar, like you're going to have to learn to be a great actor or actress to get through this. So I, I love that you're reiterating that you got to remember that goal. Yes, it, it's hard to do. And it takes a yeah. lot of self-control. It takes a lot of self-control. Um, what you focus on grows. That is a metaphysical principle that I used in my own divorce. Um, and I'm just to say, I've been happily married for 25 years to my second husband. So um, wow. there's, there's life after divorce very often. Yeah. But uh, the tack I used with my second, my first husband, who was someone who was always withholding money. And generally because he had an addiction, he, you know, he, there's a whole story in the background there, not, not important right now. But what I did often was say to him, you're such a generous person. I know you'll understand this. I know you want the best for the kids and you would want to provide this opportunity. And I had to struggle for every, for very much of what I got back then. And to say that was like a mind warping thing to say, but it worked. It did. Wow. It did work. Why, uh, why do you think it worked, Mickey? Because, like what elements worked, do you, do you think? I mean, you knew him really well. I knew him really well. And the wives of these guys know their husbands really well too, you know, and, and those people are the experts in the behavior and what's going to happen next, what ticks them off, how this builds. It's individual in every case, but the wife is the expert in the, in the behavior generally. So they uh, have leverage. Yeah. So you have to think what, what are those leverage points? What, what makes this person, what disarms this person? What disarm most people who are out of control like this, where they have to be super controlling and if they can't have the control, they become physical or threatening or withholding important things, right? Most people who act like that have trauma in the background. They've been abused themselves. They've watched their fathers beat their mothers. They've witnessed bad things. They've had bad things happen to them. They are coming from a place of pain and hurt. That was true with my first husband. He had an alcoholic dad. It was an abusive household. And he was always on the edge of his seat, highly nervous, highly watchful. A um, lot of anxiety and had a substance abuse problem back then because to soothe, you know, to calm, to make mm -hmm. things feel manageable, right? So it people, sounds very familiar. Yeah. So people who come from that hurt people, hurt people, you know, I mean, that's just the truth. And um, they also know that they're not acting well, most of them, unless they're really psychotic. Most people know that this is not the right way to live. So validating their good points is disarming. Mm -hmm. You had said something when we talked about getting inside an abuser's head. You said that a lot of times they need to feel safe yes. and they need to feel like, like they're winning. So keep keep talking because it sounds like you're you're starting the beginning of that by referencing your own experience with your first husband. Yeah. So as I said, the the wives are going to know, um, or the female partners, you know, depending, um, are going to know what this person's soft spot is. In my case, it was generosity. It was mm -hmm. I knew that he wanted to feel like he was a good person. And so I would affirm that as much as I could and assume that with this characteristic that he would be generous, 
that he would support his family because he had always said he was working for his family. He was working so hard for his family. So I held him to it. That is that's so interesting. And it and we also think about how appearances matter too. Yes. And if I could, and this is another um, thing to do if if the opportunity arises is to have him hear you say on the phone or to someone else, John is a very generous guy or is a very uh, good provider or, you know, whatever you can think of to validate the personality. Now, this does not mean, and this is a very important distinction, that you're, you've lost track of who he is, that you are, uh, that you're losing your mind because you're saying these things. This is um, divorce management. It's this, strategy. It's strategy. It's strategy. Right. And he will be a lot more amenable to a process if he feels like his spouse is not going to mortify him or, um, you know, expose him. He will try to keep the peace more likely uh, if he feels he has a chance. If he feels that he's going to be attacked mortified, exposed, um, and ganged up on, he's going to come in with his dukes up. I mean, that's, you know, normal human behavior. There are certain normal reactions um, that people have to being criticized and thrown under the bus, as they say. So the, the idea in order to get cooperation to go forward and get out is not to set up a huge defense mechanism on his part, if possible. You know, these are the best case scenarios. Yeah, I mean, Mickey, I love what you said, not just about saying to the person herself or, or herself, um, you're really good knowing what it is, is that's important to him. Like for my ex, it was important for him to feel like he was a great father. So with yours, it was, he had to feel like a great pro provider, yeah. similar. So to say that to him, but especially to say it to another person within his earshot, because we know how they need an audience. So it's like, oh, everybody knows I'm this kind of person. And I, I really think it's brilliant how you held him to it by saying it to him, saying it to other people. So then if he didn't do it, he would look bad, not just to you or in the privacy of some kind of negotiation, but to this perceived audience. That's brilliant. And you want to validate any positive attributes. And most people do have positive ones. The problem is that, you know, there's the big uh, pile of negatives, but there's also a pile of positives. And so in order to get out, he has to feel comfortable enough to enter into a negotiation and something like a collaboration, say, he would have to feel somewhat comfortable about it. Now, the thing that's positive about uh, a collaborative team is that, that there can be an audience there to be really um, impressed. And many times people who don't normally behave will behave in a collaborative setting. I have seen that a number of times where they want to be especially a highly narcissistic person um, they want to be seen as reasonable mm -hmm. as uh, intelligent as you know a team player and someone who's going to be cooperative and not stupid and not you know bullying um, so so what we do in a situation like this is that we coach the wife saying, um, don't bring up irrelevant things. Don't bring up, he always did this, he never did that, you know, and, and unfortunately, 
living with an abuser over a long period of time makes people a little crazy. And um, I yeah. a crazy too, you know. <laughs> More I, than I, a little bit. Yes. I mean, you can really, you know, if you see a, um, a supportive environment, like to just blurt it all out, but that's not going to help you. You want, you want to stay calm, cool, and I, I teach people, I'm sure you do too, Lisa, uh, breathing exercises, you know, ways to uh, keep it under control. You want to get the decisions made. You don't want to have things blow up. That's the, the, um, the goal behind things. It's a also, also, sorry to interrupt you, but Mickey, you, when you said about how there's a team of people there, I think about, again, a toxic person's need for that audience. Right, and so, approval. So having a group of people, it's almost like in the courts, there's a stage. So there's all these people that this person wants to make a good impression on. Yes. So it's really a matter of getting the person to come to the table, making that person feel really good and so they could perform for an audience and act really good. And in the meantime, you're getting the stuff signed and, and done. Now it's not that it's not perfect. It's not as if um, people aren't going to delay or to uh, uh, you know maybe walk out of a meeting. But to tell you the truth, I have never had someone totally leave the building. We have I have been able to bring them back. You know by going and saying I know how upsetting this is. It's a big transition it's really hard to do i i get it i get it but let's you know and then just sit with them and hear what they're saying and and listen to them for a while and then bring them back in and that's uh not happened a number of times uh and that's what the coach is there for the mental health professional is to keep the both people to the best of our ability you know present and to go on with the process so so, so Mickey, also, I hear that as a mental health professional, as part of the collaborative process, you're not um, aligning or you're not presenting as aligning with either person. Right. So it's not like an abuser goes in and is like, oh, this is my, this is your, this is your therapist who's coming in to blame me for all these things. They're going to, they're going to be like a witness against me. It's completely the opposite it's that you're there to provide support to both. Right. So it feels like more of a loving a level playing field that's the ideal and sometimes it takes a lot but we usually work this out in advance with the wife that we are going to be supportive to him not saying you know anything about her being negative or anything but we are going to be supportive as a strategy mm -hmm. in order order to make him feel comfortable. And most of the women know this already. They know that to confront and to push is going to end the situation. Like he's going to, he won't be able to handle it. Most mm -hmm. of them understand that. And they, I, they had coached me at times saying, don't, you know, if he gets like this, don't do that, you know, because they know. They know the trigger points. They know what calms him down. They know what upsets him. And so they'll coach me sometimes saying, I'm glad you understand this and that you're not going to put him on the spot because it's going to go against getting out. It's going to go against, let's just keep it going because in the end, you're going to be um, out of the marriage. If you go into court, as you know, you know, it can be three years of yeah. battle and confrontation. Yeah. And, and Mickey, also what you said that I really want to stress is how the victim is such a an integral part of the process. Like often when you get to family court, the like you said, the lawyers are running everything and people feel like they don't have a voice. But in this type of setting where the mental health professional is working with with the different parties that one person let's say the victim can advise the coach or the mental health professional oh these are that hurt like my ex's triggers do this and don't do that and it, it brings to mind what chris and i coach people on is 
something called taking strategic oversight of your case. And we always say, you know your ex better than anyone else. Yes. And no one else has to live with the consequences except for you and your family. So you better put that knowledge to use and make sure your lawyer, or whoever's involved, that's as your ally and your advocate understands the, the leverage that you can use. So again, I love that you, you gave that example of how it's not just like professionals come in and manage everybody, but that you help that, that the parties or the one party in particular, the victim also can help manage the case by providing important information about the other side. Definitely. It seems it could feel until you get the hang of it, that it's a one down situation for the victim, but it isn't. As you said, it is strategic. It's divorce management. I tell my clients, you know, the goal is to get out. The goal is to get as good a deal as, as you can, but especially in the case of physical abuse, the, um, the deal isn't as important as your physical safety. So you, you know, we, we will work with you and keep, you know, keep this in mind so that we don't inflame the situation, that we don't make it worse. Um, that would be something that we'd all be um, thinking about, that we'd want to keep things um, as calm as possible during the meeting. So that we yeah, I mean, that's what people um, worry about. I think when, before going into mediation with an abuser, is they're just like, I'm not going to be safe, or I can't speak for myself. I I'm traumatized. I'm triggered. Like I can't make good decisions. So I don't want to bother with mediation. But what you're proposing here is completely different. Well, you'd have more, more control. Now, not everybody can do it. Right. You know, it's. It, not everyone wants to do it. Not everybody can control themselves that well to keep things rolling without like bursting into, uh, you know, a big meltdown or whatever. It's a little easier today with Zoom. A lot of our cases are done on Zoom platforms so that you don't have to be in the same room with the person. And so um, that is something that some people would find helpful. Um, we would consult with people to see, you know, if they thought that would be uh, something that would be better. I think the team would have more leverage in person, but, um, you know, in terms of the audience, but uh, that may, it may not be that much, much different. You know, it may be enough to keep it going. Yeah. I want to ask a question that that came in from my friend, the Gen X dating coach, um, and we've done interviews before. She said that men seem far less clear about their abusive, controlling ex's behavior patterns so that they tend to collapse and can't leverage for better outcomes. Do you see this in your work as well? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Would you say it again? Okay, so I know here, you know, you're using the example of a female victim, which is used a lot, but she's saying that men, and we see this also, that men um, tend to be less clear about their abusive, controlling ex's behavior patterns. I know in our practice, a lot of times um, male clients tend to still be in love with or still have a lot more hope that the relationship's going to work out, so they're not as clear, whereas also, in general, we see women who are more like, I'm ready to go, and men are kind of waffling. So I'm guessing that's what Michelle's saying here. Um, so she's saying they, they seem far less clear about their abusive, controlling excess be oops, behavior patterns. So they tend to collapse and can't leverage for better outcomes. Do you see this in your practice, in your work as well? And I, I agree with her. I see that. I mean, we see it on both sides. But when we work with male clients, um, male victims of domestic violence, they, they do seem like, oh, I can't really be a victim of abuse because I'm a man. Do you see male victims fall apart as well, where they are less clear about their goals? Yes. Um, you do. I think it, it happens both ways. You know, I think that it, uh, it's such a tricky situation and it's so complex emotionally for people 
And the patterns are usually that the abuse, you know, it goes in cycles where the abuse happens and then there's um, forgiveness and, you know, begging for yeah. redos and, and, it, and it goes on and on. And I think you said in the presentation I heard that it takes seven attempts to yeah, seven to nine, seven mm -hmm. to nine. So that's what I, you know, I can see where people waffle about, you know, both men and women waffle about um, whether they're going to continue going through this because it's, it's um, the ending is hard sometimes to get out of the pattern. Right. And also what that's, that's one of the uh, red flags of high conflict divorce that we mentioned in one of the chapters of our book. Um, when someone is, is a victim of domestic violence, male or female, that hoovering, which is the British term for vacuuming, like being sucked back into the relationship, slows the process down. So when you're in the court system, paperwork has to be filed, things have to be addressed at a certain time. And if sometimes you don't meet a deadline, you could you have to stop the process. But at least in collaborative, it's like you're on your, your own calendar, right, right Mickey? So if, I mean, they could just keep coming back. There's not specific or as hard deadlines. Yeah, I think the, the lawyers tend to want to complete the case and they tend to keep pushing forward regardless of um, the individual concerns. But the, that's the coach's job then to explain what's going on and say uh, it's their divorce. You know, if, if they're not ready, they're not ready. We put the file away for a while and they come back when they're ready and we pick it up. It's more expensive to work that way. And that's something I've seen when everyone has to get back up to speed and, you know, it's it costs extra money to go in and out of the process. But um, it is on the couple's timetable as to how, you know, how long it takes. Yeah. And so speaking of lawyers, um, one issue that we see that we know is that lawyers are trained in logic and most of the world tends to be logical, but logic doesn't tend to work as well when negotiating with an abusive person. What do you think about that? I mean, especially considering what you just said. Yes, it is difficult um, and, they, and these cases take longer because the decisions um, are hard to make for them and, and sometimes for both people like uh, they just break down you know before the decisions can really be made so then we have to go offline and work with them individually yeah uh, and we have one thing sorry Mickey go ahead some special support I just met someone recently who's very good at this that I will be referring to um, for people who are not the financial uh, brain or wizard of the family to um, give them extra support so that they can under really understand what they're signing and, and what, what they actually need and so forth. Because some people are clueless oh, um, yeah. because they've been controlled. They've had no money, you know, for 10 years or whatever it's been. So, you know, we try to get them extra support so they can actually stand on their feet and uh, make an informed decision. Yeah. So, um, so speaking of mental health, I remember one thing you said was that judges really don't care about mental health. And, but that's, it's, it's ironic because sometimes when we ask people, what, what are your goals? They're like, I want to go to court and I want the judge to listen to me and I want them to punish the other person. So very common. who does care about mental health? I don't know. <laughs> Not in the court system. <laughs> but I've work. sat in court uh, to back up clients, and I've also, uh, you know, been there as an observer. And I see that the lawyers do all the talking. The, the uh, clients often don't get a chance to say too much, and they make... Uh, the court calendar is always packed. And so their goal is to try to settle as many things as they can and move on to the next case. Mm -hmm. And so they'll often refer out to uh, um, other professionals, you know, that they have to get family therapy or they have to get, they have to go to a mediator or they have to have a parent coordinator or, you know, various other options. Um, I think probably the parent coordinators are the 
the next level of, of uh, mental health that the judges will assign if, uh, if they're that astute, you know, to actually put a mental health professional in the middle of it. But it's often very, um, you know, just a quick solution without a lot of backgrounds, unless you go to trial. And if you go to trial, then they will hear every detail from both sides and it costs a fortune. So, uh, but the tip pre-trial, there's very little chance of um, giving your point of view. So, um, so what are some of the mistakes that you see, uh, let's say, a victim's lawyer make during mediation? Collaboration, you mean? Yeah, collaboration, mediation. I mean, yeah, let's say collaboration. Okay. Look, just to differentiate, mediation yeah. has one professional doing, working for both people, and they can't advise. Right. Okay. So collaboration. Yeah, collaboration. So what we've been talking they about. Own, they each have their own lawyer. Um, it depends on how astute the lawyer is because some lawyers, and this is a very important question um, in, in choosing your attorney, the person has to have some familiarity with uh, the domestic violence situation or the coercive control situation because the Lawyers are trained to fight for their clients. That is their basic training. Um, and so collaboration has required a whole different skill set where you're not hammering the other party. You're, come, you're looking at, for a solution so that everybody in this family will be as good as possible. It's not all for my client. It's how do we work this out so that um everybody can be okay or as close to okay as possible right mm -hmm. so it's so all different, different. It. so all different. different from the family court yes. system and so the lawyers have to have special training so the collaborative attorneys have been have had special collaborative training we work in groups so that like when you came lisa to train us that we're always taking training, which we're trying to keep our skill level. As a mental health, I'm used to that. The lawyers are not. So mm -hmm. they need constant reinforcement that this is what works and this doesn't work. And they still screw up. You know, they still become too uh, aggressive sometimes. But their job is to champion their client. If they get too aggressive, it will definitely stop the process um uh, for the abuser they so it's like not, the opposite of litigation in what way what do you mean well i mean to so litigation you think of like fighting really hard right. attacking the other side doing whatever you can to win for your client for only one side but collaboration the way you're describing it is the lawyers have completely different training and it's let's work together, not so that one person loses awfully and the other person wins right. everything, but right. like the family can go on with their lives with as little damage as possible. Yes, yes that's right. That's right. It, it is a different training. They also are supposed to take 40 hours of mediation training as well. So it's very different than um, litigation. And many of them do both. You know, many of the attorneys do litigation and collaboration. Oh, so. I was just going to ask that. I was going to say, so someone who's a domestic violence victim who's dealing with an abuser and can't make collaboration work for whatever reason, could they still get like a really good quality attorney to go litigate for them from this this pool of people? It's possible, but what happens is that. Um, the collaborative attorneys, we are supposed to sign, uh, and some of them don't do it, but we strongly encourage them to sign an agreement. We have a participation agreement, which says that if this case breaks down and it's not workable, people have to start with a new lawyer. They, this lawyer cannot take them to court. So there's an incentive to settle the case in collaboration mm -hmm. 
rather than just get ticked off and say, I, I forget this, I'm going to court, you know? There's a stronger incentive to really make it happen in collaboration. And the truth is in collaboration, we solve 85% of the cases. I mean, the, the, it's a very high success rate. It may even be higher than that. It's not wow. saying that we, um, we're not perfect, but uh, we do solve, and that's, you know, they're not all domestic violence cases, obviously, they're, right. you know, right. they run the gamut. Uh, but uh, the, the, the nice thing about it is that hopefully when you leave the conference room or the Zoom room, that neither person is seething. They both, mm. both hopefully feel understood, even if not agreed with, but you know, we try to make sure that each of the parties um, understand what the situation is and see it from the other point of view to the best of our ability, um, that one person is not gonna walk away with everything. And the, the truth is, in all divorces, is that no one gets everything they want. Hopefully, you'll get what you need. But, um, and that's what we go for. You know, we try to um, make sure that it's balanced to the best of our ability, depending on the parenting plan, you know, who has the kids, how much time, all of that. Everything is looked at. The big picture is looked at. There yeah. also bird for men, extra mental health or if necessary or the kids need more support or you know the real estate appraisal we you know that we have a, like a battery of people around us that we refer to for financial consulting or whatever um so there's a lot of support involved and, yeah that's, and, that's great Okay, so another thing I want to make sure we get in here is you talked about effectively taking the temperature down in the room when things do get heated, especially when you're dealing with domestic violence victims. But the thing that I think is one of the most fascinating um, ideas you had is something I think you called, if I'm reading my handwriting properly, a passion mission that you use when you're dealing with a high conflict personality. Um, can you explain what that is and if you forgot I can hint to see what you meant. Well let me see if I if I um, am those words probably were not mine but it was um, something that you know it hit you in that way. Um, people need an incentive to get through this and um, I think the uh, and maybe this is not what you're talking about but I, it's a point I want to make anyway is that um, the, to make it palatable for the abuser to be willing to let go. And that, that is to casually, perhaps, uh, you know, that that person will go on to a better life and that that person may do better. Now, don't gag, audience, uh, but that person will find someone who would you know be a better partner for him say or her or you know have peace of mind whatever it may be that you have learned about this person what is their goal um one man i was working with uh wanted to move he had a thing about south carolina and he wanted to move from westchester to south carolina that was part of his thinking he was living in a basement of the house that uh, with his family and I would say to him you know just imagine what how nice it's going to be that you'd be on your own it would be peaceful you'd have your own place you'd be on the beach in uh, South Carolina you know and when we're all freezing up here then you're going to be in the warm with you know paint a picture for him to have an incentive to leave his place in Westchester and it worked. I mean, he could see it and he wanted out, he was miserable. Mm -hmm. So, so he, you helped him let go they, and- They needed a vision. Passion. Yeah. They needed a vision. We all need a vision. 
um, everybody does, you know, to get through this. My life's going to be better. But um, someone who's an abuser and a control freak, it's an enormous loss to lose what he has, even though it's not good, mm -hmm. even though it's not voluntary. But it's, it's scary, really scary to lose it. And it's scary for both people. But mm -hmm. uh, the loss of control is huge. So there needs to be something else to go towards with the release of this marriage. And that may be, and the other thing I would say to the partner is to say, um, you know, we, we are always going to be co-parents or so that they don't feel like they're losing everything all at once, you mm -hmm. know, that we're going to be co-parents. We may be divorced, but we'll see each other because we are going to uh, raise our children and so on. So that, um, you know, not to make any specific promises, but right. if you can. Vague. 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 We're still connected vaguely. Yeah. We'll always be connected in some way. And, um, and then whatever you do after the papers are signed, you know, that's up to you. But you need right. to... And it depends on the person and the wife is going to know this or the victim, you know, whether it's male or female, is going, going to know uh, what the, um, what the person's always talked about fishing in Canada or, you know, living in Paris or whatever, and just, you know, allow the freedom for that person to do that. If, you know, there's a fantasy involved, the potential of that. Yeah. Again, so helpful and really important to um, also protect somebody's safety, yes. to distract them with uh, this future dream that they can focus on instead of staying connected to misery. Right. And most pe people will go for that. You know, they, they don't want to live the way they're living. You know, it may be familiar, but it's not very pleasant mm -hmm. in either case, you know, for either person. I don't believe right. that the abuser enjoys the abuse. It's a release for them of misery, but it's, of course, it creates more misery. It's just like alcohol, you know, you, alcohol can be very relaxing and a good thing, but taken too far, it's a big problem, right? Yeah. The same thing with losing your temper. You can blow off steam, but you know, you blow off too much steam, it doesn't feel good. Yeah. So the abuser is not enjoying that abuse and doesn't feel good about it usually. Yeah, so here they have an alternative that will, they think, make them happy, and they're always looking for something else to make them happy. And the truth is that someone who's been an abuser in one relationship is not necessarily going to be an abuser in another relationship. It depends on the personality mix. Um, so, you know, I, I don't say that it's any person's fault, but it's always a, a dynamic that goes on. And if the dynamic is different and the person has been divorced because of the temper, they may change. Interesting. That's that's a controversial topic in this uh, community because people often say if they're an abuser, then they will stay an abuser. But you're a mental health professional. I've seen change happen. Uh, I'm not saying it's going to change with everybody, but um, say a person who's been married 20 years, uh, very, you know, mean spirited or whatever, and then is divorced because of it, they may wake up to some degree and say, um, you know, if I have, a, have, a, I have another girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever, I'm not gonna make that mistake again. They still may make it, but the other person may not tolerate it at all. And, you know, you're one thing when you're younger. You're another thing when you meet somebody, in, you know, in your 40s, for example. You know, mm -hmm. you start off on a different track. So I, I've seen people change. I'm not going to guarantee the behavior, but I've seen people change and have more uh, gentleness uh, later on. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it depends on the time. So I, um, I was going to ask about 
the story that you mentioned that you said there was a three and a half year divorce that you guys managed to settle in two days. Right. Let's hear about that. There was, you know, it's, it is, it's so complex. Um, it's hard to like distill it quickly, but um, the wife in this case was, uh, um, I don't want to say abusive, although it could, you know, certainly could be seen as that. She would delay and delay and delay uh, because of her mental health issues. She had a ton of them. And the, um, she was married to this man, her husband for 20 plus years, almost 30 years wow. and, um, and not stable and not a stable personality. She had a personality disorder. So, um, she would blow up and this was litigation in the lawyer's office. And, you know, there was a whole lot of, um, Michigas going on most of the time. What we had to do, finally, because I knew uh, the lawyer for the husband, I had a relationship with him. I mean, I just knew him from working with him at other times. So I asked him if he would be open to collaboration. And he said, oh, please, you know, let's see if we can't do this. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, we would have to meet in person. And, and the husband had moved to the South, he didn't live in the area anymore. So he would have to come up and, you know, get a hotel room and be committed to staying for a few days. And he was happy to do it. He, he said, okay, good. So then I had to convince the litigator, the New York City litigator who, you know, was pretty big time to try a collaboration. And she was not collaboratively trained, but she was insightful. So what we did, we worked as a team, the two lawyers and me, and we created a strategy. And the most important thing was we worked with the wife to make her comfortable because she was the one who was highly uncomfortable and breaking down all the time. The husband mm -hmm. was an attorney, not matrimonial, but an attorney and comfortable with reading contracts and negotiation and all that and uh, MBA who, you know, so he could look at the finances and the law and, you know, he was way outclassed her in this negotiation, right? So we had to be sure that she was very, very well supported. And that's what made the difference. We had this person I was telling you about um, who supported her in her financial documents. She got mm -hmm. down to nitty gritty. She knew, got into spreadsheets and knew everything coached the wife in this case so she felt good about making a plan and um so we had food on the table we all ate lunch together we sat around she would blow up every now and then i would take her out into another <laughs> room and uh, uh quiet her down and she just i said just let her lawyer work you know take a break she'll she'll take care of you so there was a lot of prep work and a lot of comfort at the table, including food and coffee and drinks and this and that, uh, a lot of support around the table for her to keep her at the table. Wow. And we, did it. And, we and we, and it was signed. That's amazing. In two and a half days, <sighs> but it was full-time days. You know, it was, there was a, a lot of, um, but, by the end, and some people are going to find this hard to believe, the parties hugged each other. I'm gagging. <laughs> and, and she invited him back to see their dog because she had the dog and he wanted to see the dog and they left together and went back to see the dog. This is hard. Right? So now this is stretching out like that. I don't really see happening in this community, but know. you never know. I wouldn't have either. I mean, this was not, well, it was because she finally got a hold of herself and, you know, but um, it's not, it's certainly not guaranteed, but that way, we were shocked. The team was shocked. We were like, what? But yeah, that's what happened. All right. Breaking okay. Years of hostility, not talking, not, you know. Yeah, well, 
for the moment, it's wonderful. So that's good. And it got done. That's the most important thing. Yeah. And then whatever happened afterwards, we but don't it know. It's over. And I felt that her biggest issue, mental health wise, was this divorce hanging over her head and not knowing how much money she'd have and mm -hmm. not knowing whether she could stay in the apartment she had and so on and so on. So I had a, a big investment in getting this done for her so she could think straight and get a job and get going. Yeah. So, um, yeah. but we had to really warm up the room. It was a beautiful conference room. It was very, uh, very elegant, nice place. Uh, the New York City lawyer had it. It was her, her office. And um and so forth so you know we really warmed up the room which is what she needed wow and that's amazing from everybody to get it done great and the financial specialist stayed with her at her apartment they were friends she actually found her but they she stayed the night before the meeting the night after the meeting and you know just was with her so she would stabilize yeah i can't <laughs> This is now getting so beyond. Like I can't imagine uh, this is, this is a divorced person like staying at someone's house, like having a sleepover before that's they go what, to finish up your divorce. But oh, that, whatever got it done, that's incredible. Well, that's the thing. You know, with collaboration, you can add support as you need it to some degree. I mean, this was unusual. Yeah, honestly, but uh, it took a lot, but um, it was a lot less expensive than doing litigation for another year after that, which what that. Was. Yeah. Yeah. You said three and a half years. So yeah. to, to two and a half days, that's a miracle. Yeah, it was a miracle. Wow. So, so Mickey, we have got to um, do something with this information, go back and start uh maybe talking to lawyers about some of the ideas you have because it, it makes a lot of sense and i think people listening also can understand why it makes sense and it goes it's kind of the opposite of what most people do when they're trying to negotiate with difficult people because they want to blame and they want to accuse and they want revenge and they want to win and like you said it doesn't always work it's you want to really get it done yeah it it almost never works. Yeah. When people are attacked, they their brain shuts down. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's um it's not a good negotiation uh, technique. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been so helpful. How can uh, people find you, Mickey? Let me um let me give you all my email address. Uh, if anyone has any questions, feedback disagreement you know whatever i'm interested in people's thoughts okay so i'm going to give it to you it's m for mary m for mary m m c w a d e at mac m a c dot com m yep m c mickey mcquaid m mcquaid right m mcquaid um and my uh website is the divorce coach dot com the divorce coach.com great happy to interact and you know see what you think yeah well this has been supremely helpful so thank you so much mickey and we will talk offline and take this further Very good. yeah i think it's worth uh pursuing yeah me too me too all right so thanks everybody and i'll talk to you soon mickey thank you thanks yeah. everybody bye, bye.